Michael, great to have you back on the program. So first off, uh, I got to talk about politics. I mean, it is the biggest uh, story out there right now, right here. So what about Washi Lai being ousted from the uh, political elite? Well, I have uh, no, no insider view on, uh, on, on what's happening there. But what I can say is that for the last six, seven months, and perhaps a little bit longer, there's been this tremendous debate taking place within China about what kind of reforms need to take place and what are some of the institutional constraints and the sort of code phrase uh, has been vested interests. Um, so I suspect that this is part of that debate. Certainly the events in the last couple of months were fairly surprising and suggested that the politics of this transition and the politics of this debate is more intense than many of us had originally suspected. Yes, lots of political undercurrents right now because we woke up uh, with Shanghai down 2.5%. Uh, also, Shenzhen uh, fell off by 4% yesterday after the Chinese Premier himself in his swan song press conference talking about maybe a return to the cultural revolution if reforms don't go through. Why is there all of a sudden all this talk about reforms, about uh, the Chinese politics? Well, there's been discussions about this for uh, at least a few years, and there, and there are some of us who have been arguing for six or seven years that the Chinese growth model has built into it certain underlying problems. One, of course, is that it's very, very difficult to raise the consumption share of GDP without significantly reducing investment and, and basically abandoning the growth model. The other big problem is that debt, uh, which has always been the Achilles heel of countries that have followed these investment-driven growth models, uh, has been rising very, very quickly at an unsustainable pace. Um, and I think a lot of this debate has really come to head in the last year or so. There's widespread recognition among, certainly among the more economics, li economically literal of the uh, of Beijing policymakers, that something dramatically has to change. Uh, but at the same right. time, there's a great deal of resistance, and, and that's causing a lot of this. Yeah, we talked to you about uh, this political rhetoric and what this means for the economy because it really has hit a fever pitch. Some would say it maybe shows there's a bit of desperation from the government officials to really try to balance the economy right now before it all goes wrong. What are you seeing? Well, I, I don't think, uh, I think we still have another four or five years in which they can control growth. In other words, they can keep growth levels as high as they want. That comes at a tremendous cost, and the cost is a continued increase in debt. The real question uh, those of us here have is how soon will they actually begin seriously adjusting the growth model, which is going to mean, above all, a significant reduction in the, uh, in the growth rate of investment with everything that implies. Um, so how do you balance that reduction in investment with a sufficient increase in consumption that will keep growth from slowing too much? It's not an easy question. It's a very, very yeah. tough uh, a process of figuring that out. A really tough task, uh, so much so that uh, J.P. Morgan's uh, Adrian Mowat, who's the head of uh, Asian strategy as well as emerging, saying that China's already in a hard landing scenario. Are, are you seeing that? Well, I've never really understood what uh, hard landing and soft landing have meant in this context. I think the key point is that they can control growth as long as they're willing to borrow and invest. But there's a huge cost to that. So um, if they want to see reasonable growth, and by that I mean above 7, 7.5% 7 this year, they can do so. But they can do so by postponing the adjustment costs into the future. So my suspicion is we're not going to see a rapid slowdown in growth. What we're really going to see is something more like a long landing. In other words, a decade or more of much, much slower growth rates as they slowly work out of the, uh, out of the debt problems that they found themselves in. But if you prolong the problems, don't you eventually have to hit the brakes at some point? You're going to hit a big crash and explosion. So you're saying the Chinese government officials are putting this off for now, but it's coming down the road? Yes, my guess is that they can continue doing this for four or five years before they have a serious enough debt problem that you can actually call it a crisis. But I think increasingly they recognize this. And so there's this big debate about what to do. And my guess is over the next one, two, three years, if we're not, uh, if, if we're not lucky, um, the consensus will have developed that will allow them more or less to abandon the current growth model, bring investment rates down, accept much, much slower growth in exchange for cleaning up the balance sheets and raising the consumption share of GDP. Uh, it is possible that they go right up to the wall and then we have a collapse, but it's not certain that that will happen, and I think there's enough understanding among policymakers in Beijing that they probably won't let that happen. Okay. Michael, uh, interesting insights. So thanks for sharing your time today.